Okay, we said last time um, we started sort of the overture of the class where I um, am giving an overview of the different technologies that were used. Um, and the reason for this is, is very important. It's very important that we keep all this clear in our head because if you sort of have a vague notion of how this works and you don't really have a solid notion of how it works, a lot of things will seem mysterious to you. And it is important to um, have a clear vision of how this works um, so that especially like later on when we start incorporating client-side scripting, server-side scripting into the whole package, that you really understand how it works and really understand how to use these things effectively. I mean, um, I suppose I could have just jumped in and started teaching JavaScript, but without having a sense of when it's appropriate to use JavaScript and what JavaScript is best used for, you could learn the syntax of JavaScript and still not be in a good position to use it effectively. So we give, uh, I, I give this sort of overview at the beginning of class. And I start off with a diagram that, that's going to be repeated uh, a million times throughout the course. Client connected to the internet, which is connected to a web server. And remember, anytime we talk about a server in IT, we are talking about um, a, a system, um, a mix of software and hardware that listens for and responds to requests. Now, in the case of a web server, we're talking about um, a system that listens to requests for web pages and responds. <clears throat> Do remember that the response could be some sort of error message, right? If you request a page that doesn't exist on the server, you're liable to get a 404 error. Well, that's a response still. So a server will respond to it. A client is the entity that is making the request. And again, depending on the context, we could either be talking about the person that is making the request, or we could be talking about the system. So, you know, usually we're talking about the, the specific system, the piece of hardware, and the browser. The browser is the software that allows us to view web pages, and it is through the browser that we make requests. And requests could be typing in a URL in the address bar. That's making a request. A request could be clicking a link. Uh, a request could be clicking a button. For example, when you go to log on to Canvas, you type in your user ID and password, you click the button, and it tells you whether you got your user ID and password or not. That is making a request to the web server. All right? Now, we talked uh, a little bit last time about static versus dynamic pages. And I'd like to review that and talk a little bit more in depth about that. Static pages are pages like you did in CISS 216, where the web page is already complete, and <coughs> when the user requests a web page, the server's job is very simple. It's simply to find the page and deliver it back to the client. Now, we draw the internet as a cloud in this diagram because we're not really concerned about the details. The client is connected to the server, not directly, but through the internet. And for our purposes, we don't care exactly how the request goes from the client and makes it to the server. But it does. All right? In the case of static pages, those pages are already completed. We have completed HTML, JavaScript, CSS, etc. And when the user requests a page, when the client requests a page, they simply ask for the URL of the page that they want. The web server finds that, the appropriate files, 
and delivers them back to the client. So, again, terminology is important here. The user makes a request, the server gives a response. And that response consists of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, in the case of static pages, that's already prepared and is simply waiting for the user to request it. Kind of like Big Macs are already prepared and sitting in a bin and just waiting for someone to order one. Now, really, very few websites and very few popular websites are static these days. All right? Why? Well, simply because that sort of static information, you know, this is what many of the first web pages were like, where it just provided, uh, you know, people would sometimes call it like brochureware, where it's like having a brochure except it's a web page instead of printed on paper. That doesn't provide a lot of the features that people want in web pages. People want interactivity. People want customization. People want my page to look different than your page, for example. People want to be able to have some kind of interactivity, whereas I search for something, it gives me search results that I've typed in for, customized for me. All right. The one classic example I could think of where you might still have a static web page would be like for a restaurant. All right. A restaurant, you go to a restaurant, there's really no customization for an individual, right? I mean, a restaurant has a menu. Everyone can order off that menu. A restaurant has a location. And these things are not updated that frequently. That's another indication of a static website is any changes to them have to be made manually. So if a website changes often, um, it's likely not going to be a static website simply because having a developer go in and changing the HTML code is very relatively time consuming and costly. It's much better if it can be changed in some other manner. All right, dynamic pages are any pages that are, are typically going to be pages that are different for each individual, different based on the user input, all right, um, has frequently changing content. So think of something like eBay eBay changes frequently, right? People are constantly adding items to be auctioned on eBay. Uh, the individual items are constantly changing because people are bidding on items. And the deadline for the auctions changes, right? Um, you, know, if, you know, right now there might be 12 hours left. In an hour, there'll be 11 hours left and so on. And then finally the auction is over uh, at the certain time of day. So. Static means unchanging, dynamic means changing. So anything that changes frequently or changes based on the user or changes based on the user input, all these things are examples of, dy of dynamic pages. So Facebook, your Facebook feed changes probably every minute, right, as new people will add updates. The weather, the weather changes frequently, all right, based on storms that come in, new information. This weather front came in further to the south than we thought it is, so instead of getting six inches of snow, we're going to get two inches of snow, or whatever. All right. These are all examples of things that change and change frequently. All right. And what's more, are specific, can be specific to a user. So, a request that comes in, in static pages, the only thing you need is a URL, right? Because everyone's getting the same thing, all right? You go to a restaurant and you ask for the menu, everyone gets the same menu, all right? So all you have to do is ask for a menu. With a dynamic page, there can be information such as, and this information goes as part of the request, information such as data that's entered on a form. All right. You go to Google and search for PHP. I go to Google and search for JavaScript. All right. We're going to get different results. We're both doing a Google search. We're both going to the same page, but my page is going to look different than your page. All right. And it gets even even more 
complex than that. Because if I were to search for Italian restaurants, and my brother that lives in New York City were to search for Italian restaurants, we'd get different results. Even though we typed in the exact same thing in the Google search bar. Why? Because sent along with the form information in the URL is the IP address. Now the IP address, uh, we talked a little bit about protocols and TCP IP last time. The IP address identifies your specific computer on the web. Now, typically that information can be used to determine at least approximately where you are located. So if I were to Google Italian restaurants and, and my brother in New York were to Google Italian restaurants, He'd, get, he'd send his IP along with his request. I would send my IP with my address. Google search engine would be able to, and in fact does, look up to see where that IP address is coming from and can give you different results, right? So Google Italian restaurants. You're going to see a bunch of results from Illyria if you do that, you know, around, you know, if you do that from the lab today, all right? Does that mean that, Google, that Illyria has the best Italian restaurants in all the world? Well, probably not. That means that Google's script recognizes based on the IP address that you're in Illyria, Ohio, and therefore it's going to customize it based on that. Um, part of the request, the platform that you're on. Are you on a Mac versus a PC? What browser are you using? Are you on a mobile device versus a computer? All these things come into play, right? And all these things can be used to customize the results. For example, if you visit CNN from your phone, you're going to get a different look than CNN if you visit from the desktop, all right? It's smart enough to know that you're on a mobile device and therefore it's going to customize the output for you on a mobile device as compared to someone on a computer. All these things are possible because this information and more goes as part of the request. And these dynamic pages contain instructions for creating a web page. <coughs> you can think of it as like being a recipe for a web page instructions of how to create the web page. So, in the case of Google, there's a database that the script goes out and looks for. And when it does a query for the database, it takes into account your location. It takes into account probably your previous search history, and so on. All right? And it uses that to prepare your results. These dynamic pages are not written exclusively in HTML. Because in CISS 216, nothing we talked about gives any idea that you can do this kind of stuff with HTML. Because you can do it in HTML. These kind of pages are written in PHP or ASP.NET or JSP or Ruby on Rails or Python or any number of different services server-side scripting languages. And the details of these server-side scripting language might be different, but they all serve the same job. They all take the request and do something with it and prepare a response based on all the parameters that come in with the request. Input data on the form, your IP address, the platform, and a whole bunch of other information. That, are, that is taken as a factor when the web server runs its instructions, interacts with the database perhaps, and comes up with a response. So dynamic web pages are written in these languages and take into account all these factors when it prepares a response. So you get a response especially for your request. All right. So when you log into Canvas, you see your courses. You don't see every course that's offered on Canvas. All right? 
When I log on to Canvas, I have different menu options because I'm the instructor in the class and, and you're a student in the class and so on. Now, here's the important thing. When the day is done, the client requested a web page. So they better get back a web page. They need to get back a web page. All right? So when the web server does all this processing, looks at the instructions that are contained in these dynamic PHP or JSP or whatever pages, interacts with the database, does whatever it's going to do, the output that it produces is just a regular old HTML, CSS, and JavaScript document. Again, just like Subway, right? There aren't pre-made sandwiches sitting on the, in the bins in Subway. There's a server that has some instructions in their head of how to make a, a turkey club or a, um, uh, a meatball sub or a tuna sub or whatever. They take your input as far as like what kind of bread you want, um, do you want it toasted or not, and so on. And they make a sandwich just for you. But, this is a critical point, when the day is done and the server is done with their job, they give you a sandwich just like you go into McDonald's and order a sandwich. You get a sandwich. Because that's what you came in for. That's what you requested. So in the case of a client requesting a web page, they better get back this. doesn't matter what the server has to do on its end to produce it. What gets delivered back to the client is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So in a nutshell, Server-side scripting is used to create web pages. All right. These pages are dynamic, which means that they can be specific and based on many factors such as the user input, the location of the user, the platform of the user, maybe the time of day. All right. You go to a website of a TV network, for example, right? If you went to ESPN's website to see what's on ESPN, it would tell you what's on between 9 and 10 a.m., 10 and 11, 11 and noon, and so on. You come back later today at, let's say, 6 p.m., and it'll tell you what's on at 6 to 7 p.m., 7 to 8 p.m., and so on. You think someone went and changed that website? No. All right? The server-side script is simply smart enough when it looks up what TV shows are on to know, well, use the current time as your starting point. All right? So that's what server-side scripting does. It's used in the creation of web pages. All right. <clears throat> what then is client-side scripting? All right. Well, client-side scripting is written in JavaScript, first of all. So while there are choices on the server side, there really is only one language on the client side, and that is JavaScript. The whole idea of client side means that these instructions, because whenever we talk about scripting, we're talking about a set of instructions. These run on the client side. Well, what does that mean to say it runs in the client side versus runs on the server side? Well, look at how these two entities interact. The client interacts with the server by making requests. They get routed through the Internet and somehow end up making it to the right web server. And then the response comes back and somehow makes it back to the right client. That actually
actually is a time-consuming operation, all right? And that can depend on a lot of factors, how fast that is, all right? For one thing, how much internet traffic there is on that day. How good is your internet connection? Are you dialing in on a 1200 baud modem, all right? Or do you have, you know, the fastest connection available, all right? Is it a very heavy news day? and a lot of people are pounding the internet. Is there some sort of technical difficulty or outage on somewhere on some of the uh, important nodes uh, in the internet? All these things can be factors in how fast your internet connection is. Likewise, how much traffic is the server getting? You know, again, if it's a big news day, I distinctly remember when uh, the day Michael Jackson died. I remember trying to go to like CNN and try to get information uh, from it off of my phone. Well, I wasn't able to. Why not? Well, a couple reasons. First of all, there could have been a lot of traffic on the, on the uh, um, cellular network um, back then. And secondly, this, I'm sure everyone was doing that, was going to all the popular news sites and looking up information. All right. So this round trip to the web server and back actually is a very time-consuming process, all right? Very time-consuming process compared to how fast instructions can run on this machine, all right? Instructions that are loaded within the browser of this machine can work virtually instantaneously because this is the bottleneck in the process. That is what takes a lot of time. The instructions running on the computer don't take a lot of time. All right? So, what do we use client-side scripting for? We use client-side scripting, or what are the advantages of client-side scripting? Then we'll talk about what we use it for. We use client-side scripting for things that we want to happen pretty instantaneously. All right, things that we want to have happen without like much of a delay. Well, gee, wouldn't we use it for everything then, right? Don't we want everything to happen instantaneously? Well, there's a catch. Because the client typically does not have access to all the resources that the server does. For a number of reasons, for security reasons, for technical reasons, and so on. So the client doesn't have access to, for example, the server's database, right? That wouldn't make sense to do that from a lot of different perspectives. So what kinds of things do we want to do on the client and that we're able to do on the client. Well, we have the advantage of it being very quick on the client, but we have the disadvantage of we can't do any of the real heavy lifting, all right? So for example, we can't use client-side scripting to do a Google search, right? That has to run on a Google server. Google, our client does not have the resources to do that, all right? It, again, it just doesn't. So, okay, a Google search, we have to go and run on the server. What are some of the things we could run on the client, though? Well, well can anyone think of things that maybe we could run on the client? Something that doesn't require a lot of resources. Okay. Theme on a page. Theme on a page? Yeah. Okay. So what do you mean by a theme on a page? Okay. All right. All right. You can change, for example, the look of a web page. All right. And you can customize the, the look of a web page. All right. Uh, I know you used to be able to do it in Angel. You probably can do it on Canvas. Um, I just never looked at that. All right. So, how might something like that happen within this model? Well, 
could be that what comes down as part of the response is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you're able to change the JavaScript, or change the CSS, rather, via the JavaScript to make it look a certain way. All right? That would be an example of something that could run client-side. That doesn't require a terrific amount of resources. All right? Don't have to go and inquire from a database or do anything like that. There's no security issues. That's another thing I forgot to mention with that. You're simply changing the appearance of an existing page. So changing the appearance of an existing page is a good example of something that you would do via client side. In fact, it's one of the classic examples. The theme is one example. Another example are um, um, drop-down uh, menus. All right. Let's pull up uh, an example. There they go with the card. I'm convinced that there's a group of people whose job it is is to follow me around campus and push that cart past every single class. And when, like, it accidentally gets like oiled and doesn't make any noise. They like take it to the shop to, I don't know, like mess up the bearings on the wheels or something like that. So it, it's particularly loud. And I'm not paranoid, by the way, but you know, you never know. What was the old saying? Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean that they aren't out to get you. All right. Here's a classic example of some JavaScript functionality. And let's talk about this to make sure that we understand why this is a good example of JavaScript functionality. <coughs> Did I forget to turn my... Oh, okay. no, let's come here. Okay, here's ESPN's web page. I'm not even a huge sports fan, but I tell you, I switched from like doing news examples to um, doing like ESPN because like when you do news examples, you see some horrifying stories and it's just tough to take <laughs> first thing in the morning, you know, and it's like, oh, I don't want to read about that today, right now. All right, here's an example of classic example of client-side scripting. I go and put my mouse over these items and pretty much instantaneously they appear. All right. Well, why is this a good example of client-side scripting? Well, first of all, the instantaneousness of it is critical. Right? This would not be effective if we clicked on, or if I put my mouse over this, and there was like, even like a second delay, or two second delay, that would be, that would be interminable um, if that happened. So we want it to be virtually instantaneous. All right? Let's think about what's going on here in terms of a, of a request and a response. So I go to ESPN's homepage. I request their homepage. The server does its thing. This is more than likely a dynamic page, right? Because, first of all, there's a few little clues here. First of all, if I came back tonight, this would be different, all right? And there probably isn't a team of web developers going in and manually changing the HTML every time LeBron scores a basket, right? So this is going to be something that is dynamically generated. Second thing that's a little bit subtle, known as this. They suggested that I'm interested in the Browns. Now, do they know that I'm a loser, all right, and, and are suggesting it for that reason? Well, maybe. Or they recognize that I'm in the Cleveland area. Either way, not everyone in the world is going to get the Browns as a suggestion here, right? There's something, there's some intelligence built in to the script that says this person probably is interested in the Cleveland Browns. And likewise, Cavaliers, Indians, Ohio State, 
and so on. So these are all little clues that this was customized somehow for me. All right. Um, which means it's not a static page. Not everyone would get that. All right. So sometimes, somehow, the, the request was processed and it decided to deliver me this web page. Now, I could actually go in and add a favorite, you know, and I could probably log on and create a login. Or if I was, for example, a, um, you know, a, a, Instead of an Ohio State, I was a, you know, a Michigan fan. I could say, no, you know, I went to Michigan, I'm more interested in them or whatever. And then it would be customized to me as an individual. Now, what got sent back to the client is an HTML page. But some of the HTML you see and some of the HTML you don't see. All right. All these menus that exist here were sent back as part of the original request and response. So the response contained all these menus for these different areas that we can put our mouse over. And what was also sent was some JavaScript that says we can change the page. If the user puts their mouse over NFL, we show the NFL menu. If the user puts their mouse over the NBA, we show the NBA menu and so on down the line. So this is a great example of client-side code. All right? Because we're not going in and trying to access ESPN's database. We're simply making small changes to a page that's already been delivered to us. Just like theming, right? With theming, we made small changes to a page that was already delivered to us. All right, let's see if I can find a very simple example of theming. This page used to have it. I hate when they change my examples. <laughs> this page used to have, this is a page for a school for uh, people with, uh, that are visually impaired. And again, that includes things other than completely blind, right? Um, but you used to be able to go and like change the colors, change the font size, and all that very easily. Ah, there we go. Yay! <laughs> Customize their view. Right. So, for example, again, not everyone that is visually impaired is blind completely, so maybe I want the font to be bigger. I can zoom. Or maybe for my particular vision problem, that is a better color scheme. All right. So these are simply taking a web page that's already been delivered and tweaking it a little bit. Doesn't require access to any kind of mega resources. All it requires is some scripting, some instructions that say, when the user does this, the page changes this way. All right. And these are classic examples of client-side scripting. So making small visual changes to a page is a great example of client-side scripting. All right? So client-side scripting is good at, first of all, making small changes to an existing page. A page that's already been delivered. So in the ESPN example, the ESPN server did the heavy lifting, right? It was smart enough to know that I, know that I lived in, in uh, or I was accessing the page from um, Northern Ohio, so it gave me the links to the, the Cleveland and Ohio sports teams. It, uh, it accessed the database for the latest scores and put those on top. The server did the heavy lifting there, 
and it delivered me a page that contained the, the, the basic result, but some other additional HTML that my JavaScript then could tweak and change the appearance of it, that is, make, a, make menus appear and disappear. All right, so it gave me all the HTML that I saw originally, plus some hidden HTML that I could show or not show based on my mouse positioning. The Perkins page, it delivered me the content. Now, that could actually have been a static page, because that, that, that seems to be a fairly straightforward, simple website. But it also gave me the ability to tweak the look of the page, change the size of the, the, the fonts, change the, um, 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 the, the color scheme, and, and so on. So it wasn't, you know, I was just changing the page that it already delivered. All right. Now the instructions and the additional HTML and CSS and all that come back as part of the response. So, key thing with JavaScript is the immediacy of it. And it's something that's not resource intensive. So it doesn't require a database or anything like that. Now there's one other piece of functionality that is very common in client-side scripting, and that is validation of data. All right? So, for example, if I have a form, all right, here's a good example of it. go to our friend Google, all right? And I do not put anything in there. And I just say, I want to do a search. Looky here. It doesn't go and do a search of every single page on the internet or something like that, right? It's smart enough to know, hey, dude, you didn't put anything in. I'm not going to bother doing a search. All right. Another example. Let's say I go to Canvas. I go and click sign in. Boom. Instantly, it tells me that, hey, you know, you, you didn't enter something in. All right. This is an example of client-side scripting sort of intercepting a request because it knows that that request can't possibly work. Right? Everyone has a login of a user ID and a password. There's no one that can log in that doesn't have a user ID and a password. So that is a resource intensive to check that, right? So if you omitted the user ID or password, that can't possibly be a valid login. Doesn't have to look up the database to figure that out, all right? So what does it do? It keeps the request from going to the server because it knows that it can't possibly succeed. Doesn't require a lot of intelligence. Doesn't require looking up in the database to say, gee, is there a legal user that has no user ID and password? That's just an assumption. All right? This is a win win situation. All right? The user is a win because they don't have to wait to get a response. Now, again, to be sure, this is kind of an absurd situation that I'm coming up with, both of these. All right? 
But in a more realistic one, if I go to register for a site, for example, and I don't put in, you know, let's go to Amazon, let's say, and try to create a new account. All right, boom, you know. Let's say that I'm in a hurry. And I try to do that without an email address. All right, that's possible. Or for other accounts that require a city, state, and zip, and address, and phone number, and all that, it's possible that I could legitimately forget that. Well, by JavaScript being able to detect this, I don't have to wait for the, for the request to go all the way through the Internet for the server to say, hey, this doesn't work, and then come back. This is kind of like if I submitted a job application to a receptionist. You know, I go to an office and I apply for a job, and I, the receptionist gives me an application to fill in. And I go and I fill all the information in, or I think I fill all the information in and take it up to the receptionist, and the receptionist looks and says, hey, you forgot the back page. You know, you forgot the second part of the page. And it's like, oh, okay. Now, the receptionist didn't like perform any great analytical task there. It's not like the receptionist knew that my credentials were bad or something like that. All right, Didn't know if I was qualified or unqualified for the job. The receptionist is doing a very mechanical task. Is the whole form filled in? If not, hand it back and let them fill it in again. So rather than allowing me to submit the form, sit on the human resource manager's desk for a while, the human resource manager goes and looks at it and then calls me back and says, hey, you forgot to fill out page two. I get an immediate response. Same sort of idea here. Now, here's the interesting thing. Validation is actually performed both on the client and the server. Why do you think that is? Why do you think validation is performed both on the client and the server? Um, that would be a possibility. One thing to keep in mind is that you can easily turn off client-side scripting through your browser options. So one reason that the, the validation is done is sort of as a fail-safe. You know, your typical user probably isn't even aware of that, but your more sophisticated users could try to manipulate the system by turning it off. So that would be a possibility. There's another possibility as well why validation is performed both on the client and server. Think of the human resource example. The receptionist is capable of looking at the back part of my application and say, hey, you didn't fill out page two. The receptionist is not capable, however, they don't have the resources, they don't have the training to look and say, is this person qualified for the job or not? Should I bring them in for the interview? That requires more processing, more extensive processing. So, there's the cart guy again, all right, right on time. So, let's think of a credit card if I go to pay my bill, all right? Client-side scripting can look and say, hey, you forgot to enter a credit card number, all right? That doesn't require a lot of intelligence, all right? That could easily build, that doesn't require a lot of resources on the computer. However, it could even look at and say that I have the right number of numbers in the credit card, right? Because credit cards are a certain number of digits, right? So if I put in my credit card number as 12, the client side would be smart enough to say, no, nah, that's not a valid credit card number. But does a client have resources? Does, could client side coding have enough resources to look at that and say, hey, that's a credit card that's over its limit, or that's a credit card that was reported stolen? Or well, that's a made-up credit card number. It looks like a real credit card number, but it doesn't match anything in the MasterCard or Visa or American Express database. All right? That's the kind of validation that does require extensive resources. All right? So, again, it's a resource issue. The things that require a lot of resources have to be done on the server. The things that are very simple and straightforward can be done on the client. And the, thing that, the things that can be done on the client, 
if you let the client do them, everyone's happier, right? The user's happier because they get a quick response. The server's happier because they're not getting inundated with all these requests that the, the client could handle just as easily uh, by, by itself. All right? All right, there's one more piece in the puzzle, and that is Ajax. We'll go over that next time, and then we'll start getting into the actual JavaScript portion of this class. Any questions? All right, we'll see you in lab.